The Arabian Nights. The Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor. In the times of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, there lived in Baghdad a poor porter named Hindbad, who on a very hot day was sent to carry a heavy load from one end of the city to the other. Before he had accomplished half the distance, he was so tired that finding himself in a quiet street where the pavement was sprinkled with rose water and a cool breeze was blowing, he set his burden upon the ground and sat down to rest in the shade of a grand house. Very soon he decided that he could not have chosen a pleasanter place. A delicious perfume of aloes wood and pastilles came from the open windows and mingled with the scent of the rose water which steamed up from the hot pavement. Within the palace he heard some music as of many instruments cunningly played and the melodious warble of nightingales and other birds and by this and the appetizing smell of many dainty dishes of which he presently became aware he judged that feasting and merry-making were going on. He wondered who lived in this magnificent house which he had never seen before, the street in which it stood being one which he seldom had occasion to pass. To satisfy his curiosity, he went up to some splendidly dressed servants who stood at the door and asked one of them the name of the master of the mansion. What, replied he, do you live in Baghdad and not know that here lives the noble Sindbad the sailor? that famous traveller who sailed over every sea upon which the sun shines. The porter, who had often heard people speak of the immense wealth of Sinbad, could not help feeling envious of one whose lot seemed to be as happy as his own was miserable. Casting his eyes up to the sky, he exclaimed aloud, Consider, mighty creator of all things, the differences between Sinbad's life and mine. Every day I suffer a thousand hardships and misfortunes and have hard work to get even enough bad barley bread to keep myself and my family alive, while the lucky Sinbad spends money right and left and lives upon the fat of the land. What has he done that you should give him this pleasant life? What have I done to deserve so hard a fate? So saying, he stamped upon the ground like one beside himself with misery and despair. Just at this moment, a servant came out of the palace and taking him by the arm said, Come with me, the noble Sinbad, my master, wishes to speak to you. Hinbad was not a little surprised at this summons and feared that his unguarded words might have drawn upon him the displeasure of Sinbad. So he tried to excuse himself upon the pretext that he could not leave the burden which had been entrusted to him in the street. However, the lackey promised him that it should be taken care of and urged him to obey the call so pressingly that at last the porter was obliged to yield. He followed the servant into a vast room where a great company was seated round a table covered with all sorts of delicacies. In the place of honour sat a tall, grave man whose long white beard gave him a venerable air. Behind his chair stood a crowd of attendants, eager to minister to his wants. This was the famous Sindbad himself. The porter, more than ever alarmed at the sight of so much magnificence, tremblingly saluted the noble company. Sindbad, making a sign to him to approach, caused him to be seated at his right hand, and himself heaped choice morsels upon his plate and poured out for him a draught of excellent wine, and presently, when the banquet drew to a close, spoke to him familiarly, asking his name and occupation. My lord, replied the porter, I am called Hindbad. I am glad to see you here, continued Sinbad, and I will answer for the rest of the company that they are equally pleased, but I wish you to tell me what it was that you said just now in the street. For Sinbad, passing by the open window before the feast began, had heard his complaint and therefore had sent for him. At this question, Hinbad was covered with confusion and hanging down his head replied, My lord, I confess that, overcome by weariness and ill humour, I uttered indiscreet words, which I pray you to pardon me. Oh, replied Sinbad, do not imagine that I am so unjust as to blame you. On the contrary, I understand your situation and can pity you. Only you appear to be mistaken about me, and I wish to set you right. You doubtless imagine that I have acquired all the wealth and luxury that you see me enjoy without difficulty or danger, but this is far indeed from being the case. I have only reached this happy state after having for years suffered every possible kind of toil and danger. Yes, my noble friends, he continued, addressing the company, I assure you that my adventures have been strange enough to deter even the most avaricious men from seeking wealth by traversing the seas. Since you have, perhaps, 
heard but confused accounts of my seven voyages and the dangers and wonders that I have met with by sea and land, I will now give you a full and true account of them, which I think you will be well pleased to hear. As Sinbad was relating his adventures chiefly on account of the porter, he ordered, before beginning his tale, that the burden which had been left in the street should be carried by some of his own servants to the place for which Hindbad had set out at first, while he remained to listen to the story. I had inherited considerable wealth from my parents, and being young and foolish, I at first squandered it recklessly upon every kind of pleasure. But presently, finding that riches speedily take to themselves wings if managed as badly as I was managing mine, and remembering also that to be old and poor is misery indeed, I began to bethink me of how I could make the best of what still remained to me. I sold all my household goods by public auction, and joined a company of merchants who traded by sea, embarking with them at Balsora, in a ship which we had fitted out between us. We set sail and took our course towards the East Indies by the Persian Gulf, having the coast of Persia upon our left hand, and upon our right the shores of Arabia Felix. I was at first much troubled by the uneasy motion of the vessel, but speedily recovered my health, and since that hour have been no more plagued by seasickness. From time to time we landed at various islands, where we sold or exchanged our merchandise, and one day, when the wind dropped suddenly, we found ourselves becalmed close to a small island like a green meadow, which only rose slightly above the surface of the water. Our sails were furled, and the captain gave permission to all who wished to land for a while and amuse themselves. I was among the number, but when after strolling about for some time we lighted a fire, and sat down to enjoy the repast which we had brought with us. We were startled by a sudden and violent trembling of the island, while at the same moment those left upon the ship set up an outcry, bidding us come on board for our lives, since what we had taken for an island was nothing but the back of a sleeping whale. Those who were nearest to the boat threw themselves into it, others sprang into the sea. But before I could save myself, the whale plunged suddenly into the depths of the ocean leaving me clinging to a piece of the wood which we had brought to make our fire. Meanwhile, a breeze had sprung up, and in the confusion that ensued on board our vessel, in hoisting the sails and taking up those who were in the boat and clinging to its sides, no one missed me, and I was left at the mercy of the waves. All that day I floated up and down, now beaten this way, now that, and when night fell I despaired for my life. But weary and spent as I was, I clung to my frail support, and great was my joy when the morning light showed me that I had drifted against an island. The cliffs were high and steep, but luckily for me some tree roots protruded in places, and by their aid I climbed up at last and stretched myself upon the turf at the top where I lay, more dead than alive, till the sun was high in the heavens. By that time I was very hungry, but after some searching I came upon some eatable herbs and a spring of clear water, and much refreshed I set out to explore the island. Presently I reached a great plain where a grazing horse was tethered, and as I stood looking at it, I heard voices talking apparently underground, and in a moment a man appeared who asked me how I came upon the island. I told him my adventures, and heard in return that he was one of the grooms of Mirag, the king of the island, and that each year they came to feed their master's horses in this plain. He took me to a cave where his companions were assembled, and when I had eaten of the food they set before me, they bade me think myself fortunate to have come upon them when I did, since they were going back to their master on the morrow, and without their aid I could certainly never have found my way to the inhabited part of the island. Early the next morning we accordingly set out, and when we reached the capital I was graciously received by the king, to whom I related my adventures upon which he ordered that I should be well cared for and provided with such things as I needed. Being a merchant, I sought out men of my own profession, and particularly those who came from foreign countries, as I hoped in this way to hear news from Baghdad, and find out some means of returning thither, for the capital was situated upon the seashore, and visited by vessels from all parts of the world. In the meantime I heard many curious things, and answered many questions concerning my own country, for I talked willingly with all who came to me. Also, to while away the time of waiting, I explored a little island named Cassel, 
which belonged to King Mirage, and which was supposed to be inhabited by a spirit named Degyal. Indeed, the sailors assured me that often at night the playing of timbrels could be heard upon it. However, I saw nothing strange upon my voyage, saving some fish that were full 200 cubits long, but were fortunately more in dread of us than even we were of them, and fled from us if we did but strike upon a board to frighten them. Other fishes there were only a cubit long which had heads like owls. One day after my return, as I went down to the quay, I saw a ship which had just cast anchor and was discharging her cargo, while the merchants to whom it belonged were busily directing the removal of it to their warehouses. Drawing nearer, I presently noticed that my own name was marked upon some of the packages, and after having carefully examined them, I felt sure that they were indeed those which I had put on board our ship at Balsora. I then recognised the captain of the vessel, but as I was certain that he believed me to be dead, I went up to him and asked who owned the packages that I was looking at. There was on board my ship, he replied, a merchant of Baghdad named Sinbad. One day he and several of my other passengers landed upon what we supposed to be an island, but which was really an enormous whale floating asleep upon the waves. No sooner did it feel upon its back the heat of the fire which had been kindled than it plunged into the depths of the sea. Several of the people who were upon it perished in the waters and among others this unlucky Sinbad. This merchandise is his but I have resolved to dispose of it for the benefit of his family, if I should ever chance to meet with them. Captain, said I, I am that Sinbad whom you believe to be dead, and these are my possessions. When the captain heard these words, he cried out in amazement, Lackaday, and what is the world coming to? In these days there is not an honest man to be met with. Did I not with my own eyes see Sinbad drown? And now you have the audacity to tell me that you are he, I should have taken you to be a just man, and yet for the sake of obtaining that which does not belong to you, you are ready to invent this horrible falsehood. Have patience, and do me the favour to hear my story, said I. Speak then, replied the captain, I'm all attention. So I told him of my escape, and of my fortunate meeting with the king's grooms, and how kindly I had been received at the palace. Very soon I began to see that I had made some impression upon him and after the arrival of some of the other merchants, who showed great joy at once more seeing me alive, he declared that he also recognised me. Throwing himself upon my neck, he exclaimed, Heaven be praised that you have escaped from so great a danger. As to your goods, I pray you take them and dispose of them as you please. I thanked him and praised his honesty, begging him to accept several bales of merchandise in token of my gratitude, but he would take nothing. Of the choicest of my goods, I prepared a present for King Mirage, who was at first amazed, having known that I had lost my all. However, when I had explained to him how my bales had been miraculously restored to me, he graciously accepted my gifts, and in return gave me many valuable things. I then took leave of him, and exchanging my merchandise for sandal and aloes wood, camphor, nutmegs, cloves, pepper and ginger, I embarked upon the same vessel and traded so successfully upon our homeward voyage that I arrived in Balsora with about 100,000 sequins. My family received me with as much joy as I felt upon seeing them once more. I bought land and slaves and built a great house in which I resolved to live happily and in the enjoyment of all the pleasures of life to forget my past sufferings. Here Sinbad paused and commanded the musicians to play again while the feasting continued until evening. When the time came for the porter to depart, Sinbad gave him a purse containing 100 sequins, saying, Take this, Hinbad, and go home, but tomorrow come again and you shall hear more of my adventures. The porter retired, quite overcome by so much generosity, and you may imagine that he was well received at home, where his wife and children thanked their lucky stars that he had found such a benefactor. The next day, Hindbad dressed in his best, returned to the voyager's house and was received with open arms. As soon as all the guests had arrived, the banquet began as before, and when they had feasted long and merrily, Sinbad addressed them thus, My friends, I beg that you will give me your attention, 
while I relate the adventures of my second voyage, which you will find even more astonishing than the first.